Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our weekly Penguins podcast. Andrew Destin alongside Matt Venzel. We're checking in with you guys for the first time since the trade deadline, and a lot has happened since then. I'm just going to get into it right off the bat. The Penguins in March have gone 3-6-1, and one, one of the worst defenses in the league over that stretch. The offense was pretty maligned until a six-goal outburst against San Jose and Detroit. Crosby went 11 games without a goal, and as of Monday morning, the Penguins are five points out of a playoff spot. Um, it's been that kind of month. It's been that kind of year for the Eastern Conference, certainly. Um, I'm just going to pose it to you this way, Matt. Uh, what have your been, takeaways been of the Penguins this month, and is there any possible legitimacy to the conversation of the Penguins possibly still making the playoffs with 15 games left to go? Well, you laid out why, <laughs> how they've been bad. I mean, they've really struggled. They've looked disinterested, um, you know, really since the trade deadline, um, you know, that loss in Calgary really felt like the pin in the balloon for this team. Um, they did beat San Jose, which is the worst team in the league. They did beat Detroit on Sunday, a team that's ahead of them in the playoff race, but a team is just, free fallen just as hard as they are, um, you know, mathematically, yeah, they're still in it. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of person who deals in absolutes and say, okay, there's no way this team is making the playoffs. Crazier things have happened, but, you know, mathematically speaking, um, if you look at some of the analytical sites, um, you know, their odds of making the playoffs are anywhere between like 3% and 15%. Um, so not good. Um, and, you know, what I've seen from this team in recent games doesn't make me think that suddenly they're going to surge, but it could happen, I guess. Theoretically speaking, it could happen. Is there any one thing you point to with, you know, mentioned theoretically it could happen? Is no, there there's nothing to point to <laughs> other than just pure mathematics. <laughs> That's where I'm at, too. It's like anytime I watch the team, any eye test, anything these guys say after, like you mentioned, beating a bad San Jose team, a really bad San Jose team, a reeling Detroit team, it's like, any takeaways they have from that, it's the equivalent of, you know, you're winning a game against, you know, somebody you're playing pickup basketball against like your younger brother. It's not that you actually like accomplished anything. It was just like a, a paper trophy. But I mean, no, I mean, there are things you can point to. The problem is for every one positive thing you point to, you can point to three, four or five things that are wrong. I mean, we talked so long about this team not getting secondary scoring and they're getting it. I mean, we're seeing guys like, you know, the fourth line had two goals the other night against San Jose. I think that that's when that happened. Yep. Um, we're seeing Pustin in score. The power play, um, you know, even if it's not the prettiest thing, like a puck hitting off Riley Smith and going in, I mean, at least the power play is producing. Um, for so long, we saw Sidney Crosby and his line mates carrying the team without getting anything from anyone else. And now Sid's not scoring until this last game. And those guys are stepping up. So I think those are a couple of things you can point to. But then, you know, there's a million other things you can point to and say, okay, um, you know, Here's, here's all these other reasons why they probably aren't going to make a push here. Um, I think the big one is the defense. I know that you have some numbers that you pulled um, in the much Mar in the month of March to just kind of point to how um, just how bad they've been defensively. I mean, you know, some of these games, I mean, what's it, four or five games this month where they've allowed five or more goals. Yep. Um, we saw it again against the Rangers on Saturday. Um you know, and that speaks to just like the lack of determination and, you know, you know, interest. It's like I did and, and, you know, doing what it takes to potentially make a climb. They just kind of like, all right, we're going through the motions here. Yeah, defensively, certainly something I wanted to segue into next. And before we do that, I want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. Again, that's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Um, that, yeah, you kind of just hit on it, a lot of it right there, especially you know playing with fire, as you said, against the New York Rangers. Carroll's in another, a number of games, uh, you know, Mike Sullivan said, I believe it was after the game yesterday, you know, he brought up a point that the Penguins have played eight games in 13 days, you know, that, you know, maybe fatigue was something that could be in play for this team. But when you look at the raw numbers, it's yeah, they've given up the most goals in the league in the month of March. And it's not just because they've played 10 games, which is more than any other team. They're also third in most goals given up per game. It's over well over four, it's 4.3. 
the only teams ahead of them, this might be a huge shocker, um, it's the Detroit Red Wings and the San Jose Sharks. So it's not just the eye test that's really failing this team um, from what you and I are seeing. There's tangible numbers there just in terms of simple statistics, what they're giving up in terms of odd man rushes. I mean, I had a conversation with Lars Zeller about three or four days ago, and he had noted, you know, I'm not sure are we above or below five odd man rushes that were given up per game. Is that kind of like a litmus test for them of where they're at defensively? Um, they're well above that number. They're giving up the 30th most, or sorry, the third most uh, odd man rushes per game right now during the month of March. So, you know, there's certain things you can point to defensively, um, whether it's the critical errors that are turning into goals too, like a Chris Letang turnover against Edmonton. You know, it feels like all of those are kind of starting to spiral and uh, turn into goals. Um, but yeah, I mean, across the board, it's just not been a good defensive effort. As much as people wanted to malign the offense the first part of the month, um, the defense really consistently has just not been there for the guys in front of either Jari or Nadelkovic, it feels like. Well, Sullivan's point about the Penguins playing a lot of games in a short period of time, but it's March. It's that time of year. Every team is going through that. Hey, guess what? The Rangers just played six games in nine days. Um, they won both games over the weekend. Um, every team's gone through it. So I don't really buy that excuse. And then, um, yeah, and then in terms of the scoring, um, you know, they're scoring now, but for the first half of the month or the first week of the month, they had two goals in four games. So it just kind of seems like, um, you know, they talk about firing in all cylinders. I mean, these guys at maximum have fired in at one cylinder every single game. So um, it's just not a recipe for success. So, yeah, I mean, like we said, mathematically speaking, there's a chance. It's like Lloyd Christmas. You're telling me there's a chance. Um, but, you know, the Penguins, with their actual play, nothing about it suggests that they're about to make a run here. But, like I said, stranger things have happened. Not to continue with the Dumb and Dumber references, but I feel like Dumb and Dumber talking about this Penguins team, especially these last month or two on this podcast. But I'm certainly the Dumber of the Well, team. that was a bad, awful dad joke. Which one of us have kids? <laughs> Come on. I'm, I'm sorry, man. Um Okay, I wanted to get into one talk, topic, though. You you wrote about him, um, you know, a, a little bit less than a week ago, I believe it was, on Michael Bunting. You know, obviously the one NHL guy, NHL guy that the Penguins got back in the Jake Gensel trade. Um, you know, a physical guy, a little bit of a pest. I mean, what's kind of been your analysis, your takeaways from seeing Michael Bunting, who scored Sunday against uh, the Red Wings, second goal at the Penguins? What have been your analysis of uh, Bunting, just in a brief sample size here? Yeah, I think he's been all right. I mean, he's kind of what, you know, we expected here. I know Sullivan made the comparison on a lofty one around here, said he's similar to Patrick Hornquist in some regards. Um, you know, I think he was just referring to the fact that he is a knack for getting under people's skins. I think stylistically speaking, um, you know, I see a lot of Brian Rust in his game, um, gets in on the four check, um, has a lot of energy and puck pursuit goes to the net, maybe not a great finisher. I know his shooting percentage and Brian Rush shooting percentage on their career are pretty similar, um, but they're more kind of volume shooters where they just have a knack for going to the net and eventually they're going to whack one past the goalie. So I think that's what we're looking at here. I mean, I think Bunting, just like Brian Russ, could potentially be, um, you know, a 20-goal scorer next season. Um, he could be a guy who moves up and down the lineup like we've seen with Brian Russ, but – um, you know, certainly he's no star player. He's not going to make up for the loss of Jake Gensel. But, you know, in terms of getting a, a veteran player back, um, you know, I think it's a, a, a pretty solid option to plug into the lineup. But the Penguins obviously need to address that the wing position in the offseason, um, you know, and find a way to bring in an impact player or a couple of guys who are, you know, kind of on the same vein as a rust or a bunting and just kind of build out the depth as opposed to going for just one player who can come in and potentially hit the 30 goal mark. Not to look too far ahead to the off season, but obviously certain they'll have to address, you know, building up a little bit more of that top six, bottom six with a couple more wingers like that. Um, but with bunting. Well, well, oh, go, sorry. I was going to go ahead. I, I had another point on bunting, but let's see no. what you got here. Oh, I was going to say, you know, is this a guy with two more years left on the contract that you realistically think the Penguins could keep around for that tenure? Or is this somebody who you wouldn't be surprised if the Penguins were to move off, say, you know, next summer or at the next trade deadline to try and re revamp the roster? I, I mean, that's like so far down the road, it's not even worth <laughs> thinking about. I mean, truthfully, a lot could change. I mean, this team could could sell. This team could just go 
you know, in full and rebuild, um, or maybe they have an upswing and they need to include a salary like Bunting. But yeah, I would expect him to be around given his ties to Cal Dubas from the OHL and Toronto. And, um, you know, as long as he's a stylistic fit, I mean, if he turns out to be a total dud, um, you know, like we saw with Kapanen, they could move on. Um, yeah, I think it's too early to kind of speculate on whether he's going to play out that contract, but uh, they definitely brought him in to, to be here. Um, you know, and obviously things can change. And the point too I was going to make with Bunting is is the power play. Um, yep. I do think he is a useful player in that area. He brings something to the table that they've lacked. Um, we've talked about all year about putting guys in different positions and moving people in and out. And they haven't really had a good player. You know, fans fixate on the net front. Um, and Bunting is obviously a guy who can, you know, get in front of the goalie and cause some havoc on the power play. But to me, the bigger thing was the bumper spot, which that's the guy in the middle, um, you know, picture the power play formation and, and sort of like a diamond look and the guy who's parked right in the middle of the hash marks. Um, that's become a really important position in, um, you know, the NHL today on the power play. Um, you know, different guys do different things in that spot. Um, you know, we see guys who are more like playmakers, passers. We see guys who are like one timer threats. Um, Joe Pavelski um, with the stars. He's very good at tips and deflections in that area. Penguins really haven't had a guy who just kind of felt like a natural fit there. But what we've seen from Bunting, um, you know, just look at the power play goal he set up to to Lars Eller against the Rangers. Um, you know, the puck found him in the middle and he quickly gathered it and found Eller at the back door. Um, and, you know, they just haven't really had that kind of playmaking out of the bumper spot. So I do think that's one thing that, um, bunting can bring to the table that, um, you know, maybe is a little bit underrated, whereas, you know, I don't think he's as good of a, a, a player or scorer or even true power play threat as Jake Gensel. But in terms of what this team needs around Crosby, where there was a little bit of redundancy there with Jake Gensel in the power play, bunting preside, provides a different skill set, um, something they've really lacked there in that bumper spot. Yeah, no, definitely a good point to bring up, especially the power play. You know, this week, 20% conversion. You know, they've been more closer to league average. You know, that you've mentioned the chemistry, what we've seen there, the passing between Bunting and Eller. I mean, guys have spoke really highly also of how Eller is playing off Bunting really well. Um, that this is a guy who maybe hasn't been a top power play guy really throughout his career. Um, you know, Eller, obviously somebody who's been around the league a long time, playing over a 1,000 games, but on that top power play working really well, with bunting, certainly the power play is, you know, still deserving of criticism given the way that it's performed this year. But at least recently, with the two of those guys working together, um, it looks like you know, with the the with the version that they've got out there, that it's starting to maybe find a little bit of traction, which can't hurt, I guess. Um, but well, sure. If you overlook the twenty eight shorthanded goals they gave up this month, yeah. <laughs> No, it is true. I mean, they're making more stuff happen um, offensively. Obviously, they're allowing some some shorties. Um, it seems like at minimum, once a game, the other team's hitting the post shorthanded. Um, but yeah, Eller makes sense. I, I get a lot of stuff wrong uh, on this video podcast um, in writing, but I, I did get one thing right early in the year when I said Bunting, or uh, not Bunting, Eller is a guy that they should try on the top power play. And the rationale was, you know, maybe he's not the most skilled player, and that's why he hasn't been a, a top unit type player throughout his career. But, you know, just watching him play, I mean, he knows what he's doing before the puck gets to him. He's, he's He's thinking one play ahead. And for a unit where we saw Malkin or Latang or Carlson kind of dragging the power play to a grind with how deliberate they are, you know, Eller was a guy that, okay, the puck's coming my way. I already know where I'm going with the puck before it gets to me. And it just kind of sped up the power play, which is something I feel like they really needed. Now, sometimes you could argue maybe they're getting a little too sped up, and that's why they're getting some of these shorties against. Um, but I do think that's why the coaching staff ultimately went to Eller and ultimately why they stuck with Eller because of that ability to just kind of like get these guys moving and, you know, actually make instinctive plays instead of just talking about it. Yeah, certainly. It, two guys certainly have been on my mind of just what the impact has been there for the power play. Um, I want to transition this now to talking about a guy who isn't currently here in Pittsburgh, um, and that's Sam Poulin. Um, he's got eight points in six games since returning from his last injury for Wilkes-Barre. Um, I just wanted to ask you, point blank, um, what's it going to take to get pooling up here? I know a lot of fans want to hear about that, um, just based off of what you've observed, what you're hearing. I mean, what do you think it's going to take for pooling to get up here? Is it going to have to be the Penguins going into a free fall slide and officially being knocked out of playoff contention? What do you think it's going to take? 
Well, they're not going to bring him up unless they're going to play him. And that's the big thing there. I mean, they feel like he's going to play a lot in Wilkes, um, particularly for a team that is pushing for the playoffs, probably going to get a playoff run in there. You know, and let's not forget this is a guy who has missed a lot of hockey over the last three years, um, whether it was due to COVID or his mental health break or injuries this year. So I do understand that part of it. Like, we don't want to bring this guy up if he's going to be a healthy scratch or he's going to play eight minutes on the third line. Um, So I personally think he should be up here. Um, I kind of think the season's a lost cause. And, you know, I think it would benefit him to get some NHL games now. And then you can always send him back down to Wilkes for a playoff run. Um, You know, I think the Penguins need to figure out exactly what they have in Poulin, um, you know, heading into the summer so they can plan accordingly. But, um, you know, if you look at the Penguins, they're obviously not totally waving the white flag, at least not the the coaching staff. Um, So I could see them saying, okay, like we don't want to bury this guy or have him not play. So we're not going to have him come up here. So I think that's kind of where they're at. Um, You know, I think it, you know, the fact that Drew O'Connor has played so well, we're seeing Pustinen start to produce, Um, you know, I don't think they're going to sit down Riley Smith. I mean, so I I think, you know, you look at the middle of that lineup, um, that's kind of where Pula needs to slot in. Um, You know, I don't think it makes much sense to play him on the fourth line on the left wing where Emil Bemstrom's playing. So, I get it. I understand maybe why at this particular moment in time they feel like he's best served to be in Wilkes. But I think if they drop a couple more games here this week, um, you know, it's time to give him a shot and see what you have in there. Um, but it's easier for me to say I don't have skin in the game. Uh, my job's potentially not on the line. I'm not coaching the team. So, um, you know, that's I think that's kind of what the uh, maybe the I don't want to say disconnect, but that's kind of maybe the different perspectives on whether or not he should be here now or or not yeah no it's certainly a good rationale and you touched on something there that i wanted to just have you briefly expand upon um you know you mentioned him wanting him to probably be in the middle of that lineup either the second or the third line you know why would that be you know this is probably obvious but why is that important for Poulin's development rather than sticking him on the fourth line and giving him 10 minutes a game why is it better for his development well it's utilization okay because i mean he you know moved to center um with you know once he turned pro and was in Wilkes, he played a lot of wing. Um, you know, he did he did play center his last year of junior, but um, he was drafted as a winger. So he's learned to play more of a, a two way game. Um, but he's hardly a shutdown player that you want out there. Um, defensive zone starts, um, you know, killing penalties. Maybe that's something he can dabble in a little bit. But it's just he's not that. You know, that's not the best way to use him. And I do think. And I agree with this thought process is the Penguins don't want to put guys in positions to fail. They want to put them in positions to succeed when they get caught up when you're dealing with young players and confidence. So I just don't think it would make a ton of sense to say, okay, like, let's just plug this guy in on the fourth line, you know, easy peasy. And he plays X minutes. It's more about the minutes in which you'd play. And I, I think Poulin, if he's going to make it to the NHL, I think it's as a third line player. We'll see if he sticks at center, if he makes it to the NHL, if he plays wing. But just a guy who's, you know, more of a two-way player, you know, not great defensively, but, um, you know, responsible enough. And, you know, not a guy who's going to challenge for 30 goals, but maybe he comes in and provides a little bit of offense. I think that's kind of looking where he is now in his development. I, I think that's probably the most likely outcome if he does make it to the NHL. So I think that's why it makes sense to to want to play him in kind of that middle six role where he's in a position to kind of play to his strengths and he's not doing things that, you know, he probably shouldn't be doing, like playing with Jeff Carter. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly agreed. Um, you know, and the only note I have to add on there is that He's gotten a little bit of time on the penalty kill in Wilkes, but it's certainly something that hasn't been part of his DNA of his game, you know, throughout his time coming up through junior and throughout um, Wilkes-Barre. So, you know, to force him into that kind of a role initially, probably not the best for him. But um, just one more topic I wanted to get on here. We're looking ahead. It's not something we usually do on these podcasts is getting into individual games, but um, there's a trio of road games coming up for the Penguins that it feels like could be pretty significant. Um, for the Penguin season, for whether it'll be the nail in the coffin or put them on life support. Um, The Penguins coming up Tuesday, you'll be there in New Jersey. Then it's on the road to Dallas and uh, Denver to play the Avalanche, Colorado Avalanche. Um, What are you looking at for this three-game road road stretch? Excuse me. How important is this for the Penguins? And what do you think is going to be the outcome when we talk again on Monday? 
pain. <laughs> no, I, I mean, they need to win the Devils game. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's mathematically considered a must win, but when they play these teams that are ahead of them or jostling with them, um, you know, it's we talk about how they're five points out of a playoff spot entering the day Monday, which is true, but how many teams are between them and the final wild card spot? Like still, what, three, four teams in there? Yep. So it's not as simple as like, okay, we got to catch this one team. It's like all these other teams, um, even though they've all been losing. I mean, the Red Wings have lost a ton of games. The Islanders are sputtering again. Um, the Devils are kind of the same boat as the Penguins where they just cannot get in gear. But, um, you know, the Penguins have to jump a few teams, not just one. So they got to win these games against the teams that are between them and that wild card spot at this point. Um, they did it against Detroit, um, and now they got to do it against the Devils. And if they don't win that game, and then they're going out west, um, you're on that trip. I haven't looked at the schedule. That's not a back to back, right? No, Crazy. it's Friday, Friday and a Sunday. Yeah, I mean that's a brutal. That would be a brutal back to back. But even so, I mean, two tough teams. I mean, you could argue that those two teams are the the best teams in the West. I mean, Colorado is just um, an awesome team. The Pens did beat them on home ice earlier this year, which felt like an eternity ago. Um, but that was one of their best games of the year. So, I mean, we know that the Penguins have this, you know, it's the NHL. You can beat anyone on any given night. I mean, look at Arizona, they're beating teams. But um, maybe they can beat one of these teams. But I would be stunned, um, you know, just given the the travel logistics and how the Penguins have looked recently and how good the Stars and the Habs look if they went out there and beat both of those teams. So the Devils game is huge. If they drop that game, uh, especially if they drop in a regulation and then have to head out west for those two games. Um, it's going to be really hard to see them getting off the mat, um, you know, so we'll see. Yeah, certainly a big ones coming up. Uh, got our eyes particularly glued on that one Tuesday against New Jersey, and then things only get more di difficult from there. Um, just looking at the standings real quick for those interested. As of Monday morning, Detroit in eighth with that 74 points. The Penguins trailing again by five at 69 points, but the Devils are only behind by a point. And New York Islanders, uh, Washington Capitals sitting there with 73 each. So everybody's jumbled up like Matt saying, uh, got to stay tuned for that to see what happens this week. It'll be certainly impactful for the rest of the Penguin season. Um, time for us to get into our stick taps to wrap this up. Matt, you want to lead us off here or is this in my corner? Who deserves a stick tap? Nobody deserves a stick tap. <laughs> I don't know. What do you got? I'll I'll, I'll try to be open minded here. I mean, this is going to be as annoying as I ever am on this podcast. So oh, prepare God. yourself. Is it, no, like no, no. Matt, is it Matt Nieto? I mean, we haven't seen Matt Nieto in like six years. It's somehow worse than that, if you can oh, believe God. that. Okay, um, stick taps to Devin Cooley for the San Jose Sharks making his first NHL start. Oh, uh, I this is big for me. First time a guy from Santa Clara County has started in an NHL game. I really enjoyed that. And I only bring that up because he grew up. How do I leave this? If I hit this red X, will I leave the conversation? Yeah, that's that's how it works. You leave the studio. Oh, all right, go ahead. No, no, that's it. That's all I have. And uh, and enjoyed talking about California with Jack St. Ivany, the new call-up for the Penguins. I enjoyed that. Why wouldn't you just say Jack St. Ivany? I did, but I thought I'd make it a little bit more personal. I'm showing my personality on this podcast. I don't do that that often. Well, why don't you talk about Jack St. I, I reject your stick tap. I appreciate you <laughs> not having a lot of good things to say about the local hockey team. <laughs> Nobody cares about California, where you're from, the Sharks. Why don't you talk about Jack St. Ivy? That seems like more relevant to our, our uh, listeners, viewers, etc. Glad, gladly. I'll give a 60-second summary. Yeah, St. Ivany called up uh, earlier this week over the weekend, um, you know, right-shot defenseman who the Penguins don't exactly have a lot left in the system after tra trading away Chad Ruedel. Um, hasn't gotten to an NHL game yet. They've still stuck with John Ludwig and P.O. Joseph as the third pair. But St. Ivany is a guy who's taken a lot of leaps forward this year. Uh, Kyle Dubas is talking – really highly of him both on podcasts uh with josh Getzoff, or or the play-by-play -play broadcaster here for the penguins and as well in uh, you know talking with the media this is a guy that he's really hyped up it's been big growth um after playing at yale and boston college st ivany um had a really tough first year in wilkes um in se this second season he's taken steps forward he's a defensive-minded guy not terribly dissimilar from chad um, just in the sense that he's steady. So he's like 17 inches taller than Chad. Yeah, I was going to say, he's 6'3", so he's got about 5, 6 inches on Chad. No offense to Mr. Ruedel, but um, similar style of player, probably a little bit more physical, maybe a little bit better of a skater, but all told a defensive-minded guy that wouldn't be surprised if he gets a shot here, but hasn't yet played in the NHL. So we'll have to see what the Penguins have in St. Ivany if they ever get him out there. 
That's better. Um, I mean, we mentioned some of the guys who have done good things recently. I mean, you know, Bunting has done some all right things. Eller, obviously. I'll give a stick tap to Brian Rust. Um, he hit the 20 goal mark again. That's five straight years in which he's hit the 20 goal mark. Um, not that that's like the biggest milestone, but we're talking about a guy who, um, I don't know, did he even score 20 goals in a, in a college season, let alone his college career at Notre Dame? I mean, for this guy to work his way from, you know, a fourth round player that was considered to be um, no skill whatsoever until into a guy who just hits 20 goals every year. I mean, I think that's quite of an accomplishment. And also, I mean, these 20 goal marks, it's, it's not, it's never been in a full season, which you could say that's maybe one of the, the rubs on Russ is that he's dealt with some injuries, but um, you know, a couple of those seasons were altered by the pandemic. He's dealt with injuries the last couple of years, or maybe he even hit the 30 goal mark in one of those years. Um, he was certainly pacing towards that this year. And I believe last year as well. So I will give a stick tap to Brian Rust. Um, you know, this team looks disinterested in a lot of nights, um, but not that man. Um, he's still a heart and soul player and he's still chipping in offensively. Um, so yeah, let's give him a little love there. Uh, I think that's a good way to close it out. Positive note about a guy who, uh, to your point, Brian Rust career high for goals at Notre Dame was 17. Did that his senior year, if you were curious, not that you were, but. Oh, look at you doing actual research and providing real, um, <laughs> precise numbers that's very good you're a good host <laughs> i try my best here i'm just trying my hand here but anyway that'll be it for the podcast this week appreciate you guys tuning in as always we'll be back next week to recap whatever the heck happens on this three game road trip that is pretty important and we'll see you guys again next week Thank you for checking out this content from post gazette sports if you watch this video on youtube please like the video and subscribe to our channel for all of the sports coverage the Post-Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>